<laughs> so I'll do it anyway. Um, I was talking to Kelly and I was asking her how old she was. I mean, what grade she was in. And you're in the fifth grade. It's May. You're getting ready to go to the sixth grade. When I was in the fourth grade, um, we moved to Wisconsin, and my um, my mother and my grandfather uh, uh, decided that maybe we could put Dan in in a Lutheran church school at, instead of just a regular school. So in the fourth grade and the fifth grade, that's where uh, I went to school. Now, being a, a fourth grader, uh, Gracie, how, what grade are you in? She's going to fourth. Fourth grade. Going to be. Going to be. Going to be. Well, that's about when. <laughs> well, see, here I was in a church school going into the fourth grade, and after about, you know, six months, you know, getting near the end of the year, they decided to counsel with my mom and me. Now, when I say that, I'm wondering whether it was they talked to her first and then they brought me in and talked to, to the two of us. And it was suggested that I go to a public school and not finish, uh, you know, not go to the fifth grade. And um, now I'm not saying I was, you know, really bad. But apparently they had made a decision that I was bad enough that maybe I should, you know, move on. Um, uh, now, the other part of that was when I'm, I, between my mom and my grandfather and me and my whining and carrying on, these were my friends. I had trouble making friends. And I convinced them to let me stay for the fifth grade. Now, we moved after the fifth grade, so they didn't have to say, don't come back. But the fifth grade was even worse than the fourth grade. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so, let's pray. Father in heaven, beyond a shadow of a doubt, my prayer is that you're glorified. I thank you for Alicia's prayer. I thank you for uh, everybody's prayer, and I pray that as I'm doing this, that they'll continue to pray for this. I pray that you'll be glorified. That's what uh, we should be doing up here when we have this chance. So, Father, I pray that you'll be blessed, and we'll be blessed also. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. um, I went to uh, Seventh-day Adventist College. <clears throat> In the second year, they had to counsel with me. <laughs> now, I, I want to say that those issues were uh, a lot of based on my um, inability uh, to um, see uh, what God was going to do, had been doing in my heart. In fact, for me to go to a Christian college... Um, I uh, thought of it as a, uh, an opportunity to really not just learn, not just go to school, but it was a Christian college. And uh, I uh, had some very low self-esteem issues. Um, measuring up. Um, how do you measure up? You know, the, uh, I sold books before I went to the Christian college. I went into people's homes and I talked to them about the compassion and the love of Christ and the power of Christ. And yet amidst all that, you know, there was the study, um, uh, not measuring up mentality. Um, now, turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and um, most of us know that this is, um, you know, just by looking at it a little bit, if, especially if you got one of those Bibles that has some of that in it. Uh, uh, I want you to also look at the screen. 
It says God sees not only what is. He's omniscient, right? God sees not only what is and what will be, but He sees what could be. When I read uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, I read the part in there where it talks about Solomon and he prays for wisdom and God says, I'm going to give you what you pray for. I'm going to be glorified by this. And the world is going to have a better knowledge of what I'm like through you guys. And the world came. The world came to see those things. But we also know that it, it, it didn't pan out very well. It, it got very bad. So, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that God didn't desire uh, you know, these great things uh, for Israel. Um, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder. What was he breathing? Threats and murder. Threats and murder. Against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was a typical Pharisee in the in the tradition of the Pharisees. The uh, the way he he believed uh, in in what he believed was like a vindicate uh, a vindictive God, uh, not this compassionate God. They were always at odds, weren't they? Christ and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they were always at odds with Christ. They could not. Um, Basically, they were blind to what was going on. They had been blinded for so long that when Christ came, um, they ended up rejecting Him. So it says, um, as, he journeyed, as He journeyed, He came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around Him from heaven. Then He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to Him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting Me? The The... One of the interesting things that um, uh, I noticed too, uh, and by the way, I'm a little bit of a plagiarist, you know, so I pick up these things. I had, my first pastor told me that. He says, you know, Seventh day Adventists, we're pretty plagiaristic. You know, we're, we're going to pull from here and there. A lot of it, um, um, you know where it comes from, man, spirit prophecy. In Luke 10, Mary and Martha, Jesus is in their home. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she's just really soaking all this in. But at the same time, Martha is fretting and worrying and carrying on, trying to get stuff done, and she comes to Jesus and says, Would you please ask my lazy sister to come and give me a hand? I mean, I need this to be done, and she's lollygagging around. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha. It's almost like I'm sure some of you heard it. <clears throat> For me, it was, Daniel, would you do this? Then the next thing. Daniel, David. Right? Martha, Martha. Saul, Saul. The other place that I found this too was when Christ was looking at His city, this beautiful city of Jerusalem that He wanted so much for, that He... He just wept over and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. And then the last reference that I have is in Luke 22. And it's Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as we. Let, let, let's look at that just for a second. Luke 22, 31. Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, when you have returned to me, they knew Christ knew what was going to happen. Uh, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Um, so it goes on and it says, uh, and he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. 
So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but not seeing, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. So I get this impression. I really think that a lot of times for me, the, I, I read these things and I just skip over the little thing. When his eyes were opened, it's like the whole time he's sitting there and, and you can just imagine he's clenching his eyes. He's not even looking up. He's... I've been wrong once or twice. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. But he says, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there. No, he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Do you remember where it said that, um, uh, he said, who sinned, Lord, the this man or his parents that he's blind? You see the mentality? This is the mentality. Who sinned? Now, now, it says, he believed that this blindness was a punishment from God for His cruel persecution of the followers of Jesus. Stricken with blindness, helpless, tortured by remorse, knowing not what further judgment might be in store for Him. That's His God. His God is going to... to His God is vindictive. He's been wrong. He's been doing wrong. He will be punished. This is what he's struggling with as he's as he's sitting there for those three days. He says he neither drank nor ate. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus, Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. And what's his response? Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on, him, on your name. See, Ananias is looking at what the circumstances are. Ananias sees. Everybody knows Saul. Everybody knows what Saul has been up to and what Saul's planning on doing. Now, they might not see this right now. But they know that what Saul is interested in is the destruction of of these Christians. That's what his mission is. That's what his goal is. Now, the first thing that came to my mind was Ananias and how he's being used by God. And when I think about that, I think about those people that were a part of my life that continue to encourage me even though the evidence wasn't there. In fact, when I filled out my application to be a literature evangelist, they said the normal time to, to make a decision on that is rather short. But for some reason it took a year for them to make their decision about whether or not I should be a literature evangelist. And um, I even had uh, one of the ladies in the church said, you know, Dan, they came and asked us what do you think about Dan being a literature evangelist? She never told me what she said. It would have been interesting. Well, you don't know this guy. But maybe she didn't. Maybe she said, you don't know this guy. Um, so here's what God says. Now these are uh, some, you know, steps to Christ. God might have committed the message of the gospel and all the work of loving ministry to the heavenly angels. He might have employed other means for accomplishing His purpose, but in His infinite love, He chose to make Waller Church co-workers with Himself, with Christ 
and the angels that we might share the blessing, that we might share the, do the joy, the spiritual uplifting which results from unselfish ministry. When I go to the prison ministry, um, Sunday through Friday before I go, there's always a battle. There's a constant battle. There's a battle with how I'm going to respond to the to the people at work. There's a battle with what I'm going to say. There's a battle. You smash your hand, you know, and I'm, oh, my goodness, that hurt. Not, probably not out of my mouth. Um, so, but the, there's a battle going on. There's a war going on. And I show up at the prison ministry. Don't even know why I'm going. I've got nothing, and I walk in, and these guys allow me to help uplift them. That's what, that's what everybody, when we think about what that statement is saying, it says an awful lot. When you encourage me, you get blessed. When I encourage you, Right? And um, I think I mentioned this in the Sabbath school uh, last week, sometime, where uh, intercessory prayer, because of a lack of intercessory prayer in the early church, and you guys are studying the, the book, you let me know when you get to that part. I'm curious where it's at. I heard this from a pastor. He said that Sister White makes the comment that the reason that uh, Paul had died was because the church did not have intercessory prayer or enough intercessory prayer for Paul. Paul and God wanted him to go to Spain. That was what they wanted to see happen. They wanted to see... Uh, now when we say that, the, the one of the things that I come comes across my mind is, you know, to the ends of the earth. Right? But we know that that was being accomplished. <coughs> now look at verse uh, 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I, for I will show how, show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, it wouldn't be hard for us to look at Paul and say, no, that's the wrong guy. But that's not what God saw. God saw what could be. And not only did God see what could be, but God is omnipotent. He's more than capable. Right? When we read those things uh, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it says, you are a new creature in Christ. Right? Born again. Now you are the ambassadors of God. Um, now we'll get to the part where the school thought about expelling <clears throat> And this is from Fundamentals of Education. And it's about the subject of expelling kids from school. And it says, We live in a hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. Everyone who loves God in sincerity and truth will love the souls for whom Christ has died if we wish to do good to souls, our success with these souls will be in proportion, ready? In proportion to their belief in our belief and appreciation of them. When we can look at somebody and see potential, and, and I remember when I was so books, I saw this guy, he's playing with his daughter. And I mean, this guy is the biker. Right? The leather, the tattoos, the and he's playing with his daughter, and I'm like, you know, this is that guy. This is that guy. Maybe I can 
sell him some books. Maybe I can show him the Bible story books. He was a biker. He asked me to go to the next door. <laughs> but the point was that that's what God wants us to see, right? He wants us to see that this biker, can you imagine if this biker gets converted? And there are bikers that are being converted, right? And these guys are the ones that minister to the people that some of us can't reach. But our job is to encourage those, those guys in their ministry, right? Now, this is talking about restoring respect. Respect shown to the struggling human soul is the sure means through Christ Jesus of the restoration of the self-respect the man has lost. Our advancing ideas of what he may become is a help we cannot official, uh, we cannot ourselves fully appreciate. We don't even know what we're doing sometimes when we're doing that. We don't know what the far-reaching effects, you know, that are taking place in these guys' lives. Our success will be in their belief in our belief in them. You know, it, it, it's like the... the no, the, the dad or the mom or the friend or the brother or the church member who says, no, I think you can do this. I think you can do this. And you're like, no, no, I think you can do this. You think? You can be empowered. Your faith builds their faith. Now, the other part of what um, I seemingly overlooked in the Holy Spirit brings to my mind is the church was given a message of abounding grace. Much more grace. Now, um, let me show you a couple more slides, though, real quick. <clears throat> I have been instructed. These are people who have ruined their lives. They have, whether for whatever reason, <clears throat> drugs, alcohol, it doesn't matter, they've ruined their lives. And it says, I have been instructed that the medical missionary work will discover in the very depths of degradation men who, though they have given themselves up to intemperate, dissolute habits, will respond to the right kind of labor. What kind of labor? Now see, that's not how we do it here. See, we, we follow the rules. We do, you know, these are the regulations. The, no, the, the right kind of labor is to so that they're recognized, that they're encouraged, that's the right kind of way. The, uh, I think every one of us, depending on our background, tends to focus on certain things when we read in the Bible. I tend to see the, 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 it just, sometimes I see that. You know, I tell myself, no, that's not, that's not right. That's not, and then who's there to support my bad report? Say. No, Dan, you're right. You're bad. That ain't right. That's wrong behavior. Firm, patient, earnest effort will be required on our part in order to lift them up. They cannot restore themselves. They may hear Christ's call, but their ears are too dumb to take in its meaning. Their eyes are too blind to see anything good in store for them, like Paul. You know, I... It would have been interesting if you could have really got an audio of what Paul was going through. Yeah, the, the, if we're going to do the audio, we might as well do the video. <laughs> they are dead in trespasses and sins. Yet even these are not to be excluded from the gospel feast. <clears throat> they are to receive the invitation come. Though they may feel unworthy, the Lord says, Compel them to come in. Listen to no excuse. By love and kindness, lay your hands on them. Bring them in. Let them be a part of our fellowship. Faith is seeing what God sees 
and believing what God believes. When Ananias went in and put his hands on Paul, and he said what? Brother Paul. Brother Paul. They have decided to make an effort to live for Christ, but their willpower is weakened. And they must be carefully guarded by us. We're going to guard these. We're going to be standing. Satan's after certain people. We are the guardians. We guard these people. We protect them. Guarded by those who watch for souls as they must give an account. They have lost their manhood. And this they must win back. Many have to battle against strong hereditary tendencies to evil, unnatural cravings, sensual impulses were their inheritance from birth. They're born that way. You know, we, we, we hear that constant, you know, uh, nurture, nature, nurture, nature. We hear that. They must be carefully guarded against within and without. Good and evil, they're talking about the tendencies. Good and evil, you see how I want to look at it? <clears throat> Good and evil are striving for the mastery. Those who have never passed through such experiences cannot know the almost overmastering power of appetite and the fierceness of the conflict between habits of self-indulgence and the determination to be tempered in all things. Over and over again, the battle must be fought. The, the, when I was at Weimar, some of the, the students that um, uh, I associated with were uh, homeschool kids. You know, they, the, their entire uh, lives were basically, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to say this in the wrong way, but they were sheltered, they were protected, they were nurtured, they were properly nurtured. And so, when we think about when we think about their baggage, this is their baggage. They have this little baggage, but it's their baggage, and it's their battles, and it's their war. Whereas maybe some of us, we have a steamer. You know, the, we went on a steamer. We got the big old, trunk. you know, luggage trunk, the steamer trunk, right? <laughs> Now, when I was reading about uh, Peter, um, this is from Desire of Ages. I mean, uh, let's see. But he said to them, oh, this is the resurrection morning. And this is Mary. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. So the place, see the place where they laid him? But go and tell his disciples and who? Can you imagine? Peter is like Paul. He is cowering. He is fearful. He has shamed his Lord and the angels know exactly what the circumstances are and the Holy Spirit knows what the circumstances are and the angels know what the circumstances are go and tell the disciples and Peter can you imagine when they walked up we're supposed to come over here and tell you guys this and Peter he said this to you, Peter. I think Peter almost knocked people over when he was on his way back to the uh, to the grave. Um, the the one that that I also think about is the woman who was caught in adultery. Now, I'm I'm not I'm a little confused on this part. Mary Magdalene. Mary. And Martha, Mary Magdalene, Mary, right? Mary, Mary, the one who had seven demons cast out. Mary, what are we talking about? Why would we want this person as? Why would? 
It says, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. They dragged her out of the room. Jesus kneels down and He starts to draw. They want to stone the woman, right? Isn't that the law? She deserves to be stoned. And He's drawing. And everybody knows. We know what's going on. He's writing down the sins of the brothers and sisters who are going to condemn. Right? Little by little, they all slip away. They all go away. Now, here's where I get plagiaristic again. Um, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Now, I find it really interesting. This is the part, okay? The way I heard it worded is in a question, not as a statement. And the question is, no one, sir. No one. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now, ready? I'm in the prison ministry. I'm talking about this subject. And I say the same things I'm saying right here. And someone has to say, and go and sin no more. Emphatic. No more sin. Go and sin no more. Go. Right? But that's... Now this is the NIV. Okay? I couldn't find those before. But in the NIV it says, Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Go and leave your life of sin. Um... I think about um, our, our, uh, I always tell him myself. Uh, yesterday a guy uh, says, uh, he says, uh, what, what, do, what do you, you go to church on Saturday? And I said, no, he didn't say this. He says, when do you go to, where, where do you go to church? So I go to Waller. He says, what church do you belong to? <coughs> the Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, what do you all believe? Uh, let's see. We got the Sabbath. We got the diet. We got the. I, 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 as soon as I'm done yakking, right? The first thing comes to mind. We've got a compassionate and loving Savior. Isn't that what we have? We have a compassionate and loving Savior. And we've been blessed. When I read some of the things that I read, I am overwhelmed. Because sometimes I just don't get them out of the Scriptures. And I'm not saying that they're not there. We know that uh, Sister White makes the comment, if you guys would just study your Bibles, the way you should study your Bibles, you wouldn't have need of me. But at the same time, aren't we blessed with what we have in her writings? And when we say that, I heard it said uh, when I was at Weimar, God gave her the gift of knowing what to use and what not to use. If she read something that you wrote, she might read that and realize that that was an inspiration of the Holy Spirit and use that. And then the Lord gave her other things that you know were a gift just for her. Uh, I like to tell a little story. I'm colorblind. When I first joined the church, uh, I went to a garage sale. And in the garage sale, do you hear my story? And in the garage sale, I saw a beautiful plaid suit. I didn't know the suit, and I thought, that is pretty cool. Suit jacket, plaid, pants, plaid. And I bought that for three dollars. And I walked in the church that Sabbath and I was struck. Look at me. I got me a suit. And some sweet, loving, compassionate sister came over and said, You're ridiculous. 
And I'm like, I said, I look good, don't I? You know, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't hit me, right? I, I look good, right? And and then she walked away. But the be best part was there was a guy sitting on the other side. This is Central Church. He's sitting on the other side. He's got a plaid suit on, and he and he looks over at me. <laughs> People should be able to come into our church and without any questions, they should know that we believe in them and that will help their belief. God looks on each and every one of us and He says, I know what plans I have for you. And they are great plans. And I think that many times we say, well, I can't do that, I can't do that, but you'll be surprised at what God is capable of saying through you, and you don't even know He did it. And you've encouraged someone, and you sent them on their way, and they are blessed by the Holy Spirit and God, and they carry those things with them. You know, the, the most interesting thing, I think, and I'll close with this, there are many, many Christians out there that are not part of our fellowship. And when we think about the grace that these people have that we have or don't have, it makes us think that this is just that more reason why we want to continue to grow in grace and share with others. Let's not shortchange ourselves. Let's remind ourselves each and every day that we, and when I say that, I want to, we are chosen. We have been blessed. Not because there's anything special in us, but because God is special. And He loves and has compassion for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your compassion, your understanding, your power of forgiveness. Father, use each and every one of us that we might encourage someone, lift someone, see in them what you see in them, and tell them what you see in them, that they might grow in grace and also tell others about what you're capable of. And we thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our